persons for those kind words of introduction. Uh, it's always difficult to you know, come in at number three after stalwarts like Bansi Bhai and uh, Shah sir have talked. You almost feel like a Kamri coming in at the bottom end and trying to then score over them, which is impossible. But I'll try my level best. That's my topic of this afternoon, that whether metformin, after the pros and cons, we shall see in my 22 slides. And so audience knows kitna slides hai. I think somebody, everybody should be having a disclaimer kitna slides hai. So people can time their next sessions and lunch and all that. So 22 slides is the first slide. Last slide has to be a thank you slide. So 20 slides. And uh, at the outset, thank you to Bansi Bhai and the entire team for Diacarecon. So metformin, we are all aware as clinicians, uh, the journey began in the 1920s. The US FDA gave an approval in 1995, but it was used for the treatment of type 2 diabetes for in the UK in the 1958 and Canada in 1972. It's a bigonide by classification. It helps in decreasing neoglucogenesis and increasing insulin sensitivity. I have divided my slides in a very simple, I'm directly getting into the, in the core of the topic cores of uh, the pros of metformin the cons of metformin so first initial slides are purely the pros next couple of slides are the cons and then we take a tally and we still we shall see at the end whether it is still reigning the supreme uh, oad in the treatment of diabetes or not so pros no challenge here we know that type 2 diabetes especially the obese individuals the drug of choice still remains metformin especially in case of insulin resistance. We know it inhibits gluconeogenesis. It also enhances the GLUT1, that is a glucose transporter 1, mediated glucose transporter into the hepatocytes, increases GLUT4, which is glucose transporter 4, mediated glucose update in the skeletal muscles, absorption of glucose from the intestine, and stimulates the glucagon-like peptides, GLP-1 release. So definitely no sort of a controversy there, used very much widely in the treatment of type 2 obese diabetic. GDM area, uh, gray area, still a lot of people use, still a lot of people may prefer insulin. We know it's a, it's a category B drug, but the mechanism of action of control of sugars in a pregnant lady remains the same, reduces hepatic glu uh, neoglucogenesis, enhances peripheral glucose uptake, and also increases insulin sensitivity. Because polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, the important thing is it reduces the symptoms of a PCOS lady. So other than insulin resistance, other than better sugar control, also symptomatically these people feel better, reduces the body mass index of people who, ladies who have uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome or a, or, a, or a disease, assists fertility and thereby reduces the inflammation associated with PCOS as well. Obesity, uh, it contains a primary anaerotic factor. So leptin levels are found to be much decreased. GLP-1s we saw in the initial slides were, which were on the higher side, which promote a weight loss on patients taking metformin, increases mit uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, decreasing fatty acid uptake, and stimulating thermogenesis, and promotes sugar dysplasia restraints, a reducing inhibition caused by insulin-induced expression of glucose transporter protein, thus increasing glucose utilization. So in obesity, definitely a valid role of metformin. What about people who get obese on medication? So especially the example which comes to mind are antipsychotics. Remember, most of our patients who go to a psychiatrist come to you, they are a little on the heavier side, increase BMI and thereby increase sugars. So those who put on 10% of their body weight on a drug are the ones who qualify for a metformin therapy. Again, the logic remains the same. Metformin contains an anaerotic factor, decreases leptin levels, increases GLP-1, all three reasons causing a weight loss. Cancer, surprisingly, when I looked up online to prepare for this topic, a lot of cancers, breast, liver, bone, pancreas, endometrial cancers, colorectal, kidney, and the lungs are known to be benefited. How does it do that? The proposed mechanisms are through a tumor suppressor gene, the LKB1, which activates the AMPK. This AMPK you will see as a, a nomenclature in the coming couple of slides, which leads to a couple of things in the body's metabolism, whether it's inflammation, whether it's cancer reduction, and this leads to also in the cancer cancer patient inhibition of the mTOR signaling, signaling and thereby disrupts the protein synthesis and suppression of cell growth and proliferation. It also reduces the secretion of low inflammatory uh, factors and importantly because it's an anti-diabetic it will decrease the, the sugars and thereby the milieu interior as the, we saw in a physiological days if the milieu interior is returned back to the homeostatic state the cancer cells find it difficult to proliferate. Aging, same concept. So whatever works for cancer works for aging. So by inhibiting the mitochondrial complex one, it decreases DNA damage, it attenuates cell inflammation and suppression of inflammation and autophagy, all of which contributing towards prevention or delaying of aging. 
Liver disease, diabetic patient metformin caused around 50% reduction in hepatocellular carcinoma. Incidence improved survival mainly again through the same mechanical cell pathways of uh, cell growth, angiogenesis to the PIK3K, the AKT, and the mTOR signaling pathways. So these three pathways basically by reducing inflammation are seeing in the benefits of metformin in aging, in obesity, in cancer as well. Cardiovascular disease, it ameliorates HDL dysfunction and reduces HDL. I think these two functions there and then in the first point itself can make it clear that it's going to help in cardiovascular disease betterment. A reduction in HDL dysfunction improve cholesterol transport and diminish the cardiovascular risk and improves endothelial oxidative stress levels and attenuates hyperglycemia induced inflammation. So again, help useful in CVDs. Renal disease improves kidney fibrosis, normalizes kidney structure and function. Appropriate dosage of metformin is very important to note. I mean, this slide comes with a caveat. You can't give it at a, at an end stage, especially EGFR less than 45 to 40, but can be given otherwise. Summary of the pros in a nutshell here, obesity, liver disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, renal disease, aging, cancer, a lot of, lot of pros, pros over there. Cons in a few slides onwards, lactic acidosis. Now, most of the clinicians we, sitting here would agree with me. I think it's more of a theoretical side effect. We all have read it up on our pharmacological days. We mug it up. We, wa we want to write it in our theory papers. We tell it to our examiners. But how many of us have actually seen it after decades and decades of practice? So a f uh, still a few caveats. It decreases the liver uh, uptake of lactate. It is, there is no doubt about that. It does that. And any condition with precipitates lactic acidosis becomes thereby a contraindication is a strong word. I think becomes a caution that in case of infection, recent surgeries, kidney or liver damage, history of heart disease, respiratory failure, excessive alcohol consumption, dehydration. You need to be a little careful if your patient's on metformin at this at these points. And does that does that by increasing the anaerobic metabolism and thereby the lactic acid production. B12 deficiencies, this is simple. It just causes increased bacterial overgrowth in the intestines and thereby decreased absorption of, the, rather increased consumption of B12 by the bacteria and thereby a serum B12 deficiency. Also inhibits a calcium dependent absorption of B12. Hypoglycemia, this is only and only in combination with other risk factors such as heavy alcohol drinking, dehydration, excessive use of other drugs for diabetes, insufficient calorie intake or bouts of heavy exercise. So patients who do all of that and consume metformin thereby stand a risk of developing hypoglycemia. Anemia, secondary to B12 deficiency. The B12 decreases thereby causing the anemia. It's a secondary result of B12 deficiency. Cognitive impairment, two studies I have put forth. One is a larger subset of 7,000 7, patients. Other one is a smaller subset of around 1,500 patients. One has shown definitive impairment. Again, it's a controversial area. Others have shown yes, but it's elevated immediately the moment you put them on B12 and a calcium supplement. So the relationship actually between metformin and cognitive dysfunction is a little controversial. GI, uh, all of us must have seen this to an extent, a little of bloating, a little of gastritis, a little of heartburn is seen with metformin, but that's in a way quite a bit tolerable and the patient keeps on taking the GI side effects actually become lesser with the uh, increased uh, duration of usage. So to conclude, I think the pro slides were 10, the con slides were 6. So I think my take home message then becomes metformin still retains the supreme position as the first choice of oral antidiabetic drugs. Thank you so much for a, pa for a patient hearing.